What is going on? Back here with the Vigor Life podcast. And I'm very, very excited today to have none other than a Brad Stolberg on the podcast. A, a big fan of uh, the first book. And we were just talking that I actually did not know for a while that the second book was out and uh, grabbed it, read it. Um, it definitely poked me a lot. I think it's going to poke you a lot too. Uh, if you're on this show and I know there's a lot of coaches on this show, uh, that need not to just hear this, but really, really dive into this. And so first of all, welcome to the show, Brad, really, really happy, happy to have you on it. Um, and I wanted to kind of start with, I mean, I love that it was your own experience that brought you to writing the book. And, um, when I say it triggered me a little bit, I'm somewhat of a, I love what I do but workaholic, you know, push, push the boundaries. And, um, I, I know there's a lot of folks that are listening to this, that as we talk about this, they're probably falling into one of these buckets or maybe a lot of these buckets. Um, and what, what actually drove you to, to, to write the book? Because I know that again, it was some of your own personal experience that, that led you to this, which is why to me it's, it's so important because it wasn't just some, um, research. It was like, Hey, I went through this, in, in, you know, what led you to write the book and what is the practice of groundedness? Ooh, a lot to unpack here. So, uh, thanks again for, for having me. I'm really looking forward to, to, to speaking with you today and, in uh, by proxy, all the coaches in your community that are listening and hopefully some athletes and entrepreneurs too. Uh, small world. I know that you work with, uh, Carissa, who's become a friend of mine. Yes. And uh, I told her I was talking with you and she was really excited to hear that. that that's so awesome. It is a small world. All right. So here we go. Practice of groundedness. Um, what led me to write the book? A couple of things. I think the first is uh, my coaching experience. So I work with really high performers, national class, in some cases, world class entrepreneurs, executives, creators. And I noticed a common theme in, in what a lot of my clients were going through, which is lots of conventional success on the outside. So everything looks great. They've kind of achieved their goals or they're on a path towards achieving their goals. Uh, but on the inside, a feeling of restlessness, always being rushed and in a hurry, inability to sit still or be content and kind of stuck in between like wanting to do their work because they love their work, but also wishing that they could turn it off and just have like a little bit of fulfillment and peace and not always need to push for the next thing. And um, really kind of stuck in this paradox. Because what, what happened is when, when they try to turn it off, they felt worse. And, but they also desperately craved that ability to step away and, and truly have some peace. So I had been observing that in my coaching practice for, I don't know, at least a year and a half before the pandemic. And then six years ago, uh, I myself got quite ill with obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, which we could spend hours just talking about all the misconceptions that go into that. But, but for those that, that, that think that OCD is just like being organized or needing to like touch a doorknob, it is actually not really that at all. It's, it's a pretty debilitating anxiety disorder that often leads to some pretty harsh secondary depression. And I wouldn't say that my working habits caused it. I think that mental illness is a really uh, complex emergence between genetics and environment. Um, but through my recovery, it made me kind of pause and ask myself, Hey, was my work just like kind of a compulsion because I'm scared to die or I'm scared that I'm not enough. And I just kind of bury all those fears and those deep longing thoughts by just working. And is that even a bad thing? Is, is it a good thing? Is it just, is it just is it's values neutral. So I started to wrestle with this idea in my own life some six months ago. And then more recently, seeing my coaching clients just kind of, again, stuck between really working hard, not because they're a slave to the bright and shiny object, but because they genuinely like their work, but also wishing that they could have some contentment, some fulfillment. And uh, that, that was the genesis of the book, those two things. So, and, and the thing about that is too, I mean, seriously, I think that, put it this way, if, if you're a... Uh, hard pushing entrepreneur that, that loves what they do. Cause I believe I, you know, I, I love what I do. I really enjoy doing it, but, but all the things that you brought up, I, I deal with them too. And then I wrestle with what's right or wrong. Am I wrong for feeling this? I do like the work, but I do want to have more peace. But and as soon as I have too much time off, you start like going, like I shouldn't be doing this. Right. And I mean, you, you kind of went through the process of the things that help you be more grounded because 
uh, this is actually a, a question from me, from me to you when it comes to success, right? Because I believe you, you have to put a lot of time to become successful at, at your craft and your skill set. You know, where is this balance? And maybe for somebody that, that's, that hasn't been in the game for 10 years or 15 or 20 years, but is in the first five years of their career, they want to be, you know, in a top 5%, whatever that means, but they want to be successful at their craft. How to gel that with groundedness? I got to work really hard because I, I, I got to work on my skill sets, my craft, and that takes time and hours. But then how do I not lose myself in this process and, and get to a place where I'm like, well, yeah, I'm successful, but I'm not feeling all the things I thought I would, right? How, how do you kind of balance that? All right. So there's two things here. The first is you're never going to feel the things that you think that you'll feel when you accomplish success. So whether success means winning a gold medal, whether it means opening a gym, whether it means your first 10 coaching clients, whether it means series A funding from a fancy venture capital firm, whatever it is that you think is gonna bring you fulfillment when you attain it is not. Uh, there is a large body of research in behavioral science under the concept of the arrival fallacy which is just that we think that if I just do this, then I'll arrive, then I'll have self worth, then I'll find fulfillment. And what the research shows is that never happens, you get that thing. And maybe you're satisfied for like a day or two, maybe a week, but then you're hungry again. Um, the quote that really rings this home for me is in his autobiography, Ray Allen writes that the day after winning his first NBA championship was one of the hardest, most confusing days of his life. Because Raylan thought that if he just won the championship, like he'd sleep well and like he could just like he could die. He could be so peaceful. And then he woke up the next day and he's like, shit, I'm still the same. I still want more. What's wrong with me? If this can't make me happy, what will? So I think the first thing to dispel is that attaining some goal is going to make you happy. And this is where groundedness comes in. You have to find happiness in the striving, like in the path of excellence. So instead of thinking of excellence as this goal that you're going to attain, Excellence is simply walking the path day in and day out. The, the metaphor that I'd love to use to explain this is that of a, a mountain, and there's a mountain on the cover of the book for this reason. You can imagine two people climbing a mountain, and they both equally want to get to the peak really bad. One person is obsessed with getting to the peak. They're thinking about the selfies they're going to take. They're thinking about the Instagram posts up there and all the friends that they're going to tell. And they tell themselves the story that if I just get to this peak of the mountain, then people will say, oh, Luca, like you belong. The other climber equally as bad, this is important, wants to attain the peak, but they have found a way to really enjoy the climb, right? They are focused on where they are on the side of the mountain and they're probably doing it with other climbers, with friends, and they're even enjoying the beautiful view from the side of the mountain. Now, the research shows that in actual mountain climbing, People like the second climber have a better chance of having long-term success. Hmm. The first climbers, they actually tend to, um, to, to get themselves in really bad situations. It's called summit fever because this is like a real thing in the climbing world. You get so obsessed with getting to the top that you forget about the weather on the way down and you end up summiting and then dying in terrible weather because you, know, you, you made reckless decisions. And I think that metaphor extends off of the mountain because it's so easy to fall into the trap of summit fever and just like push, 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 go, go, go. And then along the way, you forget to enjoy it. You forget what your values are. You forget to bring the people that you love along with you. And then you get to the top and you take the selfie and then it's like, well, now what? I mean, it's mm -hmm. never enough. We all experience this, man. I thought when I sold my first, I thought when I sold my first book to a publisher, I'd be content. Nope. I thought that when I had my first book hit bestseller status, I'd be content. Nope. I thought that when I sold a hundred thousand copies, I'd be content. Nope. So what I've realized is that it's, it's okay to have goals and milestones, right? Like, like they serve a purpose and I'm sure we'll talk about that, but man, you've got to figure out a way to actually be grounded in the process of striving because that's where you spend 99.9999% of the time. And, and I mean, when you literally the name of the book, and I think this is kind of where I want to dive into this is the practice, right? Cause as we, as you go through there, not just the recommendations, but kind of like this view of acceptance, presence, patience, vulnerability, community, move your body. Those last two big for me, I'm biased, obviously <laughs> I got, I got, I got a gym and I, and I train people, but it, the, and that's what I want to dive into. Cause somebody that's listening, 
and I'm so big, you know, and it took me a while to figure this one out because I was the same way as far as like push, 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 no matter what. And uh, for me, Kobe's, you know, uh, I would say last speech on his last uh, game when he said it and, and he said, uh, you know, the dream, people think is the dream is the championship, but said the dream is the work. Right. And and when you figure that out and slowly but surely I've been figuring that out. But it's it's how do you know, and again, for somebody that's been doing it for a long time, you're so stuck in it. I think that's a challenging thing. But for somebody that's more in the beginning stages to understand that this is a practice and that you have to practice being able to be the guy that's with his friends climbing a mountain, you know, working hard, but enjoying the process, it, you know, and maybe what was it like for you and for your clients? when you take them through this, like, okay, I know you've been, you've been practicing training people and business and marketing and how to, you know, get audiences. Now we're going to practice something else that's going to make everything else better. Like, how does that begin? And then working on getting them better at that craft? Mm. I mean, I think it's no different than developing like a, a physical movement capacity or, or a movement skill is right. You've got to start really small and specific um, on, on the path to big goals. And then people have got to, to, to have faith in the process, but also kind of like feel a discernible difference right off the bat. Um, in terms of how to operationalize it. So groundedness, it, you name them, it emerges from six principles. And, and this isn't just my own thinking, right? This is like decades and decades of research. And then it's all the ancient wisdom traditions, right? They, they all point to these six things. And, um, for each individual principle, I really work with clients to come up with ways that they can then practice that in their own life. And I tried to do this in the book, right, in the practice sec section. So a lot of it is just personalizing what some of those practices are. So how are you going to practice accepting where you are? How are you going to practice being patient? And this is so hard for pushers, right? How do you understand when you should let something happen versus make it happen? Uh, what does it mean for you to be vulnerable? How are you going to be present? How are you going to make sure to, to build community? And then we operationalize it. So from a coaching standpoint, you know, maybe someone's goal is to jump higher or be more explosive. That's kind of the end goal. Okay, I want to be more present. I want to be more vulnerable. Well, what are the, the, the movement skills that are required? And then what are the actual like physical capacities that you have to develop through training to then be more explosive? And um, it's the same for, for the psychological skills. Like there's no magic switch. That's why it's called the practice, right? My publisher wanted to call it get grounded because they thought it would be more commercial. And I'm like, that, that's not intellectually honest. Like you don't <laughs> get grounded, um, you know, in, unless you're going to move into a monastery and get rid of all the worldly distractions, then this stuff's going to be an ongoing practice. And um, something that I'm a, I'm a huge believer of, this is, this is in the book and I've heard it framed another way by, by a coach who I really respect. So there's this notion of the good enough parent that was developed by the psychologist D.W. Winnicott in the mid 20th century. And Winnicott said, and, and if those of you that aren't parents don't hang with me, I'm going to get to this. Winnicott said that the good enough parent is not a perfectionist and they're not a helicopter parent. They don't hover over their child, but they're also not neglectful of their child. They're just good enough. They create a safe space where their child can develop and emerge to be who they really are. And when their child ventures out of that safe space, they nudge them in. And I think that for the things that we want to develop and that we care deeply about in our own lives, we have to kind of adopt that mindset of good enough. Because if we try to be great all the time, we're likely to burn out. We just have to be good enough. And this has been on my mind, I don't know, for the last six years when I first wrote the book, but it was only a month ago. I was having a conversation um, with a guy named Stu McMillan, yeah, who is, oh, you know Stu? Yeah, Stu. Yeah, I love Stu. Oh my God. So, so Stu, who co-founded Altis, he's coached over 35 Olympic medalists in sprint and power sports, um, kind of in, in track and field. He has mentors, Dan Path, who's like on the Mount Rushmore of track mm -hmm. coaches. He's from a really good coaching tree, and I look up to Stu a lot. And we were talking about developing world-class athletes. And what Stu said is that performance is a really complex system. And if I try to optimize any part of that system, there's going to be an unintended consequence somewhere else. So I just want people to be between a six and an eight out of 10 across all the parts of the system. And again, what is that saying? Like that's a practice, right? Because you get to five, then you have to get back up to seven. And um, I think thinking of ourselves and our mindsets the same way is, is really key and crucial. 
that's yeah that's definitely a very and it, it's interesting and maybe because you're so trained for me it's like you know greatness 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 for you to say hold on hold on hold on hold on good enough but good enough in all these aspects will actually and this is what i think it, grasping that good enough in all these aspects makes you great that's it. Good. Right. I mean, there's that line in the book, right? Good enough over and over and over again. And eventually you wind up with something great. It, okay. So let, let's start there. Because I think that this one is actually very, very challenging, which is the first one. And I mean, it definitely was for me. And I've gone through some uh, quite a few things in life as, as everybody has, but it's like the acceptance part, right? How? Because you don't know what you don't know. And how do you practice acceptance? You know, because sometimes that's the starting point to even know that you got to fix some other things and work on some other things. Yeah, so we do. We trick ourselves into um, into seeing things as we want them to be, not as they really are. It's called motivated reasoning. Like we can basically reason ourselves into any belief. Um, you just look at the the whole political spectrum and you see that happening a lot <laughs> these days. Um, how do you see more clearly? Well, there's a few kind of tried and true skills that we can practice. The first is when you are in a really challenging situation and you're not sure if you're seeing it clearly, if you can visualize that a close friend or colleague is in the same situation as you're in, what advice would you give to that close friend or colleague? And that's generally the advice that we need to take ourselves. So the, the coaching practice here for me, or at least the coaching example is I was working with, um, a four-time Olympic athlete, not, not, not developing their training. I leave that to y'all, but, but on the, the skills, the mental skills side of things. And, um, she's a really solid distance runner, one of the best to ever run for, for America. And she was dealing with a proximal hamstring strain, so upper hamstring and, um, it was like in year two and a half of an Olympic build. So there was, there was plenty of time, but she really didn't want to go off her training plan. Like the plan was set, she's on this path and she's hobbling out the freaking door to go do threshold tempo work. Oof. And I remember saying like, you can hardly get down the steps of your brownstone. Why are you going for like a, a track workout right now? And she just couldn't see clearly. So then I asked her to imagine that one of her training partners was hobbling out the door a year and a half away from the Olympics because a random Tuesday was supposed to be threshold work on the track. I'm like, what would you tell your training partner? She said, like, I tell them, tell them that you're crazy. Like, like bag the workout, take the day off, maybe take the week off because these hamstring things, like they, once they get sticky, they're really sticky, nip it in the bud, give yourself time to recover. And then I'm like, well, then why the hell are you going out to do this workout? And that's the crux. Like we actually have to take the advice that we give our friend or we give our colleague. Is, is, yeah, wisdom, as they say, right? Wis true wisdom is taking your own advice. But I, I think there's a second part to this. I mean, and this is the community part. I, I, and I know for me, um, you know, if you're in a community that, where, where you have psychological safety and you trust people and somebody goes, hey, listen, you know, in that case, it was it was you even bringing that that, that frame of mind. Right, a coach, yeah. Exactly, right? Like, and, and going, hey, like, I want to let you, like, I love you. Like, I'll let you know, like, what you're doing is crazy, right? Or I want you to see it from this perspective. Um, because these, I, I mean, these principles really, really plug into each other. But I feel like uh, community and environment is such a strong thing. And we'll, we'll get to it because I, that one I'm so, so, so passionate about because I've seen it transform people, you know, where it's like, it's not even maybe me as a coach. I, I, I do my job, but the environment does so much of the job and triggers different behaviors and beliefs um, in so, you know, as we go through this and you go like, okay, cool, this, this is a great practice. For instance, how do you break down? I mean, I, and, and I know just from coaching, whether it's training or nutrition, it kind of goes to the similar thing, but do clients bring their own, Hey, I'd like to work on my presence this way. I'd like to work on my patience this way. Right. Ver versus like, Hey, listen, this is what you're going to do. This is, this is the different ways that we practice patience. Um, is your approach this coactive coaching uh that it has to be I think. Uh, uh, to it. especially at first when you're building trust with someone right um because i think that it's a lot harder to kind of be the old school coach that says my way or the highway especially in today's world because then it will be the highway they'll just go find some other approach it's also really challenging though because like people log on to freaking twitter or they go on to the the forums and next thing you know they've got all these cockamamie ideas i'm sure you deal with this all the time in health and fitness for what they ought to do 
So it's really important as a coach to be, I think, to be non-judgmental and to meet people where they are, um, but to stay true to the fundamentals of like the, the practices that work. There are some things in a gym that you're never going to allow an athlete to do just because you think it's reckless. And I have the same thing with these practices. Now, if someone says that they want to practice presence by meditating and getting super into meditation, yeah, I'm down with that. If someone says they want to practice presence by actually a physical pursuit so that they start training without a phone, I'm down with that. If someone says they want to practice presence by listening to music for 30 minutes a day with no distraction, like I'm down with that. There's no kind of um, tried and true, we have to start here, but it's, uh, it's a principle-based thing. Yeah, and that's why I asked that too, because I think there's, uh, and probably a lot of it is because of social media and what we hear, and you know, these are the things that you, you got to be able to meditate which look, I'm a big fan of, but it was a difficult start. So sometimes when people have a difficult start with something and then it's not working and then, oh man, I, uh, I, gotta, I, I can't do this. But it's like, well, what if, what if you tried just training without your phone, right? Yeah. What if you tried, what, you know, what is, I, I tend to ask like, what is presence to you? And so it's To like, me, well, it's simple. To me, it's every Saturday morning, my wife hides my phone in my computer. Seriously. <laughs> This happens every Saturday morning. She doesn't tell me where they are. I feel really restless for about an hour and a half. And then I forget that they're gone. And then she gives them back to me Sunday morning. So I'm 24 hours without a phone or computer. You know what's tri and, it's tri it's tripping me out because it's like if, if my girl listens to this podcast, which she probably will. Oh, it's the best thing though, Luca. It really is because it's a few things. One, it showed me that the world doesn't end when I'm not online. Two, my coaching clients they, they respect this. Like, they're like, oh man, you're practicing what you preach. They're not like, oh, I'm not going to be able to reach you. You know, um, I'm not a trauma surgeon, so it's okay for me to be offline for 24 hours. It was hard at first. There was a lot of restlessness reaching for my phone, um, in open space during the day when I'd fill that open space with like an Instagram post or something, I had to sit with those feelings, but I also started carrying a notebook around with me. And I realized that I was a lot more creative on Saturdays because mm. I was filling open space with boredom, which gave rise to creativity. Um, so that's how I practice presence right now. I don't have a formal meditation practice. When I take my dog on long walks in the, the, the hills, I'm generally listening to music or a podcast. Um, so for me right now in my life, I got two young kids. The way it works is Saturday. There will be a time in the future, probably where I get back into meditating regularly. So I think it's a moving target. And I think anyone that says you have to do it this way, I'd be really suspect of that person. It, so I'm curious about this because what I find is that, um, you know, the, the presence, like being with yourself, that that's difficult for a lot of people. For example, I will have no problem. Um, there's certain things that if I do, I really enjoy being by myself. Nature, I can go for hikes for hours by myself, no problem for walks, this, that, the other. Uh, spending time with people, I never have a problem reaching for my phone, but at the moment I'm like uh, by myself, I feel, and maybe there's a connection to, I got to work. I got to figure, you know, I got to know what's going on and I got to be productive in, but, but what have you found that with certain clients is there certain things they can do without distraction, but then being by themselves is an issue. And then how do you go about diving into that? Like I got a tough time being with myself. I think the best way to do that is through some sort of like formal meditation practice where the whole practice is being with yourself. And um, really meditation, I think, is about learning to become your own friend. So you sit on the cushion or you lay down and all these thoughts and feelings are going to come up and slowly by slowly you separate yourself from those thoughts and feelings and you realize that like you are not any given thought you are not any given feeling you're the awareness that's holding them all and the more you can strengthen that awareness and kind of start identifying with that the stronger of a friend you become to yourself that is a lifelong process um are there other ways to to do it i think so but again, like in there's that that is why meditation is so powerful because it's just you and yourself. There's no distractions, um, and it's not for everyone though. Listen, some people they try to meditate and like severe depression ensues. That person probably needs therapy before they're going to meditate. A uh, lot of the I was just listening to a podcast with the great music producer Rick Rubin. He meditates a ton, 
but he also can't not be working on something like he falls into dark thinking patterns when he's not working on something. So this also gets back to acceptance and, and kind of some self compassion here and being like, Hey, if I am wired to create, to build, then I shouldn't judge myself. Like that's my gift. I just need to be aware of the traps and pitfalls that can come with it. So I can do it for 50 years instead of just five. See, I'm glad that you brought that up because th this whole, whole, like you should fall in X, Y, Z bucket. You know, when you start thinking that way, like that guy's doing this, I should be doing that. I'm struggling with whatever it may be. Uh, I, I think that's a, a challenging thing. Like figuring out <laughs> what's like, it's lifelong process, right? Figuring out who you are, but, uh, if, and like, it changes, so it, changes over, it changes over time you know 25 year old me might have been big into waking up at 5 a.m and doing a cold plunge 35 36 year old me i just want to like wake up by seven and make it to the coffee maker on time <laughs> and i'm trying not to judge because like it's different person different time different interventions for different reasons it's the seasons of life that's it, it it okay so th this is another thing that um i really wanted to ask you about which is for men, very, very tough, but also find it. So, which is vulnerability, right? But yeah. finding the line between what is vulnerable, what starts sliding into um, victim mentality that hurts you, mm -hmm. right? And where is that line? And what's, what's something that you've noticed as far as that's helpful to like, hey, I want to build strength through vulnerability, but I don't want to start becoming essentially a, a hindrance for me and sliding into the victim mentality. Say more about what you mean by the victim mentality. So to basically seeking, um, I, I guess that seeking support, but in a way where you're, you're not basically taking responsibility for your own life and, and taking action. So it's just, I'm, the crutch is, hey, I need help, I need help, I need help. Here's, you know, woe is me. And again, uh, I think there's not enough vulnerability, mm -hmm. you know, 100%. But I have also seen that's the other side where it's not helping you to actually move forward. Yeah, now I understand better. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, all right, the simplest way to think about this is if there's something that you actually want to say, but you're not saying that because you're scared of the reaction or you feel like you're performing, that's a really good cue to say the thing that you actually want to say. Mm. Now that assumes that it's not like massively offensive, right? We're talking in, in the context of vulnerability here. Uh, to me, that's the biggest cue. Like if you feel like you are performing, stop performing and ask yourself, can I say what I really want to say? I think there's performative vulnerability, which is different than the victimization, which does you no good. This is the person that sees that it's trending on social media to talk about like depression. Yeah. So they go make up some shit about how they were once depressed. Mm. that's not real vulnerability. That's like, that's talk about the opposite of groundedness. That is just chasing status and relevance through bullshit. Now, the victimization thing is really interesting. And there, I think that if you're in a really good community, there are going to be people that will kind of gently call you on that and yeah. say like, hey, you know, yeah, there's always situational factors, right? No, very few people ever dig themselves their own hole. But very few people are magically lifted out of a hole. Like every single hard thing is a combination of situational factors and personal responsibility. It's not one or the other. It's generally both. And, and depending on the situation, the proportion is going to be different. Um, but I don't, I don't, I almost, I almost see the opposite. I see vulnerability pre preventing you from getting into that victim thing, because if you're vulnerable, then you kind of have to accept like, I'm here and I got to rely on myself and my community to get me out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, make, that makes a lot of sense. You explained it better than I can for sure. But <laughs> and I think that's really important, especially in today's culture, right? Like pick yourself up by the bootstraps. It's bullshit. I think very few people dig themselves out of big holes completely alone. We all get help, but it's also bullshit when people are like, Oh, it's all society or it's all the system. Like we live in these systems and we have for years. And, and again, it's always a combination of both. It's never either or. And what percent of each is going to depend on the context. Yeah. And I mean, I look, since it's the fitness world, but Arnold said there's no self-made man. I, I do agree with that. I think there's, um, in, in my insecure years, that would be my way of kind of pushing myself, right? 
it's like I'm doing it all by myself. And yeah. I, I, and maybe there was times where it, it it's what got me out of bad places. But I think long term, it's not a healthy thing um, because I look I look back and I'm like, whoa, there's so many people in my life that help me, that continue to help me, that continue to be uh, the community that chisels me into who I become, um, which, you know, again, it, it brings so many things for me, for me, bring me back to community because it's been such a powerful thing. Uh, and, you know, I, I used to be a really knucklehead kid and basketball saved my life, like truly saved my life. And that was community. It was the, the, my, my team, my coach, right? And I go like, if, if it wasn't for that group of people, I don't know where I'd be. And then that transformed into fitness, where it's just, I mean, community, whether it's other coaches and, and professionals, whether it's, you know, the gym, it's such a powerful thing. And I, you know, what I really wanted to riff on certainly is one, you know, how one, how do you find community? Uh, and two, because I, I love the book uh, together, which, you know, was all about loneliness and you talk about loneliness in the book, which I, which I loved because it's such a big problem. And, but where people can be around other people, but they're still lonely, right? So finding true community, you know, uh, for, for everybody that's like, I don't feel like I have that, you know, what are some kind of uh, lighthouse posts to help people uh, go on that search? I mean, I think a gym is a wonderful place. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be biased towards my own temperament and, and towards the, the majority of the audience of this podcast. I really do think athletics and sport is one of the best places to build genuine community because it's raw and you're doing something real in the world. No one cares how much money your dad has. No one cares what your skin color is. No one cares that you came from nothing. You're either going to lift the bar or you're not. You're either going to make the shot or you're not. And um, there are very few things in life that force you to be that real and raw and vulnerable. And um, I think that is like one of the biggest benefits of being in um, some sort of fitness community that you kind of have to be vulnerable. Like the opposite of this is, you know, everyone can go back to middle school and you remember like the popular kid that like never tried in gym class. Why didn't they try? Because they were scared that they weren't going to win. They were insecure. They couldn't be vulnerable. And I think when you walk into a training situation and you're truly going to give it your all, it, it's kind of like you're in it, man. Everyone else is doing the same thing. And it, it can be relative. The dude deadlifting 600 pounds next to you and you're trying to hit 225. It doesn't matter because for each of you, you're chasing that thing that is very hard. Uh, so I think that being in environments where you're doing something real in the world and you have skin in the game and the people around you have skin in the game is a really great place to start. Um, I think the other thing here is to not mistake like loose community for deep community. So loose community is the people that are maybe like in an email group with you or are commenting on all your social media posts. And that's nice to have and that's supportive and, and, and I have a lot of fun with that. But those aren't the people I'm gonna go to if I get like a cancer diagnosis or if I'm experiencing depression, I'm gonna go to my deep community. And these are the people that I have like in-person time with that I'm seeing regularly. And I think this is so important and, and, and maybe the most important thing in the book, at least one of them, is in today's optimization culture, where we wanna be really efficient with everything. You know what's not efficient, Luca? Building community. It takes time. Mm. There are no immediate benefits. Often you don't ever even see the benefits. You kind of feel them over time. And I think this got a lot worse with COVID. Because we used to kind of have these forced communities, like we'd go to the grocery store and we'd say hi to the clerk and it'd be the same clerk because we go shopping at the same time. We go to the gym. Um, in COVID, a part of what COVID did is it really made us prioritize being super efficient, A, because we couldn't do those things. Many of us felt unsafe to do those things. And B, even if we did feel safe doing those things, we had kids at home or our business was, you know, teetering. We're trying to keep the gym open. I can't imagine how hard that was. Like you are doing everything you can to optimize your efficiency. So you're ordering groceries, you're ordering all this. And we became like these automatons that got so sucked into efficiency. And it's by no surprise that this is around the same time that the thread boys popped up on the internet, you know, 10 ways to be more productive in 10 days. 
it's like this efficiency thing took over and what gets crowded out is time for community because community mm. is slow. Yet when we're on our deathbeds, there's research that shows that the number one thing that people reflect and look back on that gave their life meaning is other people. And um, you can talk to five time medalists in the Olympics and they don't say that what gave their life meaning was the medal. They say it was training in that group or it was being coached by so and so. And um, one of my biggest fears is uh, that we're becoming kind of like slaves to optimization and what is getting left out is community. Because like I said, I said, I'm like a broken record. Community is slow, man. And I experienced this. So putting my own skin in the game, and this is why groundedness is a practice, man. When I'm on a big writing project, so let me step back. Again, I'm playing to my audience here, but all this is true. My biggest source of regular community right now in my life my neighbors, I live in a nice little neighborhood where there's no through traffic. We all see each other all the time in my gym. When I'm on a big writing project, I have two young kids. My temptation, I have a squat rack or a power rack in the basement is not to go to the gym. I can bust out my training in the basement. It can take me 45 minutes and I can be back to work. If I go to the gym, I got to commute. I know for a fact that Zach's going to want to chat my ear off. It's going to take an hour and a half to two hours. So for me, the work is reminding myself and saying, hey, who gives a shit if I don't have my best Instagram post today? Who cares if my book takes an extra four months? I'm going to drive my ass to the gym because the intervention isn't just the deadlift that I can do at home, but it's being in that community regularly. It's, <laughs> I love that you're, you're selling an efficiency. And actually, I love it. And it's, it's so interesting because I had a, a friend, a mentor of mine, when it came to, to business, and it was a ver this very similar thing. He said, you got to be more inefficient. You know, you, you got to write the handwritten thank you note. And it's, that takes longer than pressing a button where it gets printed and sent out. You know, you got to spend the time with the person. You got to meet with the person. And it's all inefficient, but it's actually, well, it does two things. It's, it's good for business, but more importantly, it's, it's exactly good for you. What builds, yeah, it's good for you and it it's builds for your soul. It's like, but I think it, that's why that's why Carissa said that we'd hit it off. Like, if I if you wanted to be the most efficient Luca take over the world, everyone knows your name. That's fine, but that's a very different path than like excellence and mastery. And I would much rather not have everyone know my name, but have some books that really impact people's lives and maybe are around after I die. I know I would rather have one gym. If I was a gym owner that is known as the best place to train than a chain of national gyms. This is and it's hilarious. just a, it's a different kind of optimization. And I'm, I'm not being judgmental because you need both. But to me, like when they took Whole Foods public and went national, I thought they're insane. I'm like, just have the best fucking grocery store in Austin. Like See, that, this, that hey, that's my temperament. And it's just I, different. I love it. I love it. I love it because it's like, it's almost like you read the line when I go speak at events and you know, I, I, I didn't want to, and I've had a lot of opportunities to, to, to grow with the gym. I said, the moment that you go wide, I can't go deep. I yep. can't become the best at my craft. And like, there's a place for that. And that's cool. Like if that's what you feel in your heart and your purpose is, but to me, it's like, I want this the best in the world. And then I want to teach it, but like, I have to stay within these confines to be able to make it that right. It's like, uh, you know, if there was more Mona Lisa's, you wouldn't go out and look at the Mona Lisa, right? <laughs> You'd be like, ah, there's, there's a bunch of those. I don't care. Um, yeah. And so I'm, I'm completely 100% bought into that. And hopefully somebody that feels that way will go. Like, hopefully oh, this cool. gives them permission to do it. You know, yes. like, yes. like, especially as a young coach, like, you know, you don't have to be Instagram famous. I think the best way to be Instagram famous is to build the best freaking gym in your community oh, yes. and get the word of mouth out. And now suddenly you got athletes stopping in to see what you're doing. All right, listen, Brad, we're, you're, you're going to, you're jumping along on, on the speaking train for fitness because this, this is the message. I 100% I, I agree with this. It's the, it's the patient part that you talk about in the book. When you do it that way, it's actually what you enjoy the process more and you, you will be more successful over time, it, period. Um, and, you know, with, there's, no, there's no way, obviously, to... Um, there, there's two more things I want to touch on. One, one is the moving your body part um, because I mean, obviously I'm, I'm biased towards this, but also I'm actually interested in maybe some of the coaching clients that were not into fitness or into moving, you know, how uh, you got them into getting movement in their life and what that looked like. Cause I think for, for a lot of folks too, it, 
it's like, oh man, I got to start training a lot and going hardcore. It's like, no, that's, that's, that's not the case. So maybe from that perspective, because anybody that's in fitness is already, you know, you're bought in into how important yeah. training is. But I think for anybody that, that maybe is uh, not on that path yet, you know, some of the science behind how moving your body helps you be grounded. Okay. So a couple of things. First, let's hit on the science here. Um, movement helps with creativity, problem solving, emotional regulation, sleep, uh, all the things, right? It's, it, it, this is like a very trite saying. Many people have said it, but it's true. If the pharmaceutical companies could figure out how to make movement in a pill, it would be the biggest blockbuster of all time. The reason that they failed is because the back to complexity, the human body is really complex and there is nothing like movement in terms of like a brute force tool that pretty much works on every system of our mind and body in a positive, productive way. So my editor said like, hey, this is a wisdom book. This is filled with psychology and kind of like mindset coaching. It feels a little bit out of place to have a chapter on movement. And my pushback was, you know, I pride myself on being rigorous and intellectually honest. And if I'm going to write a book on how to be grounded and I'm not going to include movement, then it's not going to be intellectually honest. Uh, because you take someone without a physical practice and you give them a physical practice and do nothing else and they immediately start to feel more grounded. So the way that I like to think about movement in my coaching practice with people that are not professional athletes, there's two reasons to engage in physical practice. One is for what I'm going to call foundational, physical, mental, emotional health. The other is for mastery. The first is a non-negotiable to me. The second, that's a negotiable. So a big benefit of physical practice for me is the mastery piece, right? Like I write books. I think books are pretty freaking objective. There's a blank page that's really hard to face. And then suddenly there's a bunch of words, but whether or not someone likes my book, I have no control over. It's not as clear cut as seeing the weights go up or the weights go down. So for me, that mastery, that using my body, that, that like the feeling of the bar on my back, that really tangible concreteness, that's not something I get in the other part of my, my, my job or my life. So that feels like this soul nourishment for me. But a lot of people don't need that. A lot of people, they just need to walk on a treadmill every morning for a half an hour is a starting point. That's it. They do that for two months, we get them a kettlebell, some goblet squats. Like, in, 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 and, and I don't want to get into, um, I know how strength and conditioning coaches that know the science far more than me, I don't want to get into bickering, but I think we can all agree that for someone that is completely sedentary or mostly sedentary, a regular brisk walk daily with two 20 minute quote unquote strength sessions probably gets that person 90% of the way there. And now people are going to say it's only 80%. They need more strength. That, that, that That's like to me, the, the kind of fine touches. But what I have found back to what I was saying to be the most beneficial is just to start people off with brisk walks because a for really busy hyper pushers, they can schedule a meeting while they're walking. B I find that for most people, um, you want it to be enjoyable. Like if it hurts too much, they're not going to do it. And a brisk walk has this, um, this wonderful way of kind of being self-regulating. Like the minute that it starts to be too hard, you can just lay, you know, step back on the gas a little mm -hmm. bit and it's really time effective. Now, eventually what happens, I'd say half my clients that get into brisk walking after four months, they start feeling much better. They snap at their partners less often. Uh, they think more clearly and they say, Hey, like I want to do a little bit more. And that's when we start to do a little bit more. And then the other half are just fine doing a brisk walk. And then maybe I'll say, you know, just like for your overall health and vitality, I think it'd be really good to work in just a little bit of strength work. And you can do this at home. If you want, you can hire a coach to work on your form. It's not going to be me, but just a little bit of strength work. Um, and, and that's kind of how I think of it. And then for my clients that are like really driven pushers that, that have some athleticism in their background, especially the entrepreneurs and the creatives, I think it's so important to have some sort of fitness mastery because then when things aren't going well at your company, often for reasons that you can't control, you can win somewhere else and you can have a part of your identity 
that is performance-based that's not connected to, to your, your work. I love that because you, here's part one, very important. Um, you know, and I used to be in that bucket where it was just like, I know all this stuff about fitness. So just walking and did it, you know, but that's BS because the majority of, I would say people do not do it. So if, if it has to be this massive jump for you to be in our community, that's bullshit. Right. So it's like, Hey, listen, if you start brisk walking, hell yes, because you're making progress. And the, the other part of it, yes, there's this percentage of folks that like, I know for me, I've, I've stopped being a necessarily a pro athlete for, for a long time, but I still can, um, let's just, let's just say that that performance drive, even in my forties really, really helps me. It helps me with focus. It helps me with stress. It helps me with a lot of different things and pursuing competence. And what's cool about this, you know, the three, like, what are the, I always tell people the three things that drive intrinsic motivation are competence, contribution, and connection, right? And like, yep. we really kind of like all the things we're talking about, they really help with those. And so when people are like, how do I find, you know, I, I say purpose isn't found, it's forged, <laughs> but how do you find it? Well, if, if you can work on competence in your craft, or maybe even in fitness, um, you know, contribution, creating for others, and then connection, which is the community part, which is so big, it's going to do a lot of good stuff for you, even on the motivational side of things. Um, and again, it, I think it's wrong to um, judge people because they're not doing optimal things. You know, strength training is really important. And this person's just started moving. Like, that's awesome. That's excellent, right? You'll get there. And like you said, when you keep doing stuff and you feel better, automatically you're like, I probably want to do a little bit more, right? But let, let them go down that path rather than uh, blocking them with like, you're not, you're not optimal. You should be doing three days a week of full body strength training or whatever it may be. And optimal for what? Like that's yeah, the key, yeah, right? Optimal yeah. for what? Optimal for being a athlete, optimal for mm -hmm. competing at the national level or optimal for, you know, losing 10 pounds to get out of, uh, the cholesterol, like high cholesterol risk factor. Like there's, mm. there's all kinds of optimal. And sometimes taking someone that's not really doing anything and trying to make them optimal backfires because you give them too much too soon or they experience it hurting. I mean, that's been a big, that's been like a big misconception, I think, is people think that training needs to hurt for it to be effective, or it needs to be hard. And at a certain point, that's true. But like the majority of training should be rather controllable. And you take a newbie, they don't, they, they can't differentiate an RPE seven to 10 yeah. with the same texture <laughs> that you can. An RPE seven to 10 probably has 30 different units, 7.1, 7.2. Someone that's new and they watch this stuff on the internet, they think they have to go bury themselves. Yeah. And what do they do? They bury themselves, they're sore for a week. They come it's back like, a week later, they mm -hmm. bury themselves, they're sore. A, now they're only training once a week, what good's that? And B, they don't wanna do that. So I just think like really kind of getting out of your perspective as a coach that's been in this industry for so long, not you, like you listener, the, the collective mm -hmm. us and saying like, hey, I don't wanna judge this person. And I struggle from this. So where I judge people, it's less about the brisk walk and it's more about the fads, right? Because I think all that stuff is baloney. It's like, if you want to train, figure out a program that's like progressive overload and stick to it for eight years <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> eat, and then eat a lot of food and sleep. Like, and, and that's really it, right? And then the, 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 the art of the coaching is helping someone stay on that path for eight years. But so I see these fads come up and I'm like, this stuff's bullshit. They're grifters. They're just selling something. And that's true often, but if someone's going to get into something because of a fad, then you know what? That's fine. Like if someone wears a whoop, even though I don't necessarily buy 80% of those metrics, if it's yep. going to make that person change their behavior, then, then it's, yeah. it's the best $400 that person could spend. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's like, that, that's kind of the trap that, um, that I fall into because not everyone has been around something enough to realize just how simple it really is. Yeah. And I, it's simple, it's, but simple doesn't mean easy. No. And I think that's our job as coaches. And, and it's, it's it, I have an interesting story of like somebody that's been with us for 11 years at the, at this gym and started with Zumba, but Zumba led them to, you know, it was like they started moving and it did like they felt better, they lost weight. And then they were like, you know, I need to do this next thing to progress. And literally, you know, it's like 11 years later, now she's strength training and tracking back rolls and all that stuff. Right. Yeah. But that's, that's the, the, the process. You got to start in a place where you enjoy it 
and that snowballs to more. And, and this gets back to the patient's, um, the patient's principle, mm -hmm. but my heuristic, whether it's developing physical capacity, psychological capacity, spiritual capacity, you name it. In today's day and age, 95% of the stuff out there is bullshit. And it's reckless and it is a grift. Then there's 5% remaining. Of that 5%, things can look very different. But if you just pick one and stick yeah. to it for a very long time, you're going to get where you want to go. And I think that our job as coaches, and I think that like educating consumers to realize that identify the 95% of the stuff that is just nonsense, but then amongst the 5%, you know, uh, I, I know a little bit more about the actual physical training of endurance athletes. You could do like a, a, a an interval based approach or just like mileage. And you know mm -hmm. what? They're both going to lead to tons of improvement and it's just pick a road and stick on it. I think where people struggle is they're chasing the bright and shiny objects and they get on one road, then they want to get on the other road and they want to get on the other road. And I think our job is to help them really take the long view and realize that for some things, it truly is a five to 10 year journey. Now, a good coach puts in milestones that are achievable to keep people motivated. So yeah. in the back of your mind, you might be thinking it's going to take this person 10 years to really hit what they want, but it's very hard to keep someone motivated for 10 years without observable progress. So even if you're making up bullshit, like as long as they see that observable progress, then they stay on the path towards the big thing. 100%. And that's why, that's why making sure, you know, track the wins is such an important part. By the way, I'm going to quote you on this too. I'm going to say, Hey, pick this program, do it for eight years. And that's going to be your quote. <laughs> that's, it's like, that's what Brad believes. I'm, I'm with well, you. I, I mean, so eliminate it's eliminate the 95% of the junk and then pick a program and do it for eight years. <laughs> and that's it. That's, that's, that's quotable. I love it. I, I know we're running short on time today because I knew this would happen because I could talk to you for hours. Uh, first of all, for anybody that's listening, and if you're watching, this book is excellent. Here's how you know I chewed it up. Look, it's, I love when, it. it's, when it's beat up, you know that uh, there's a lot of notes in there. So uh, Practice of Groundedness, um, seriously, excellent book. It's probably going to poke at you a little bit, but if you want to get better, it's not just the book that you read, but actually apply it to your life. Uh, I, I really, really believe it can be super valuable for you. Um, besides, you know, the book, I, where can people find out more about you and actually kind of say, get more of your content. That's not just from the book. Yeah. The, the two places that I'd recommend, um, the first is I just recently started an Instagram page a couple months ago. So on Instagram, awesome. I'm at Brad Stahlberg. And um, I've been on Twitter for a long time, but Twitter is just kind of becoming a dumpster fire. So um, I've actually had a really good experience on Instagram. It's been one of the, the things that surprised me is uh, something I've changed my mind on is for a while, I, I didn't think Instagram made sense. And, and now that I'm on it, I actually think it's my favorite of all the platforms for the kind of work that I do and the ability to share it. And then um, I co-author a newsletter with uh, a guy named Steve Magnus, who also is a performance mm -hmm. coach, uh, yeah. has more of an endurance sport background, and that's called the Growth Equation Newsletter. And you can sign up for that on my website, which is just my name, www.bradstalberg.com. Awesome. Yeah, we'll put all the links in there. And uh, now, now that you're on Instagram, I will make sure I... Uh blow you up as much as possible. <laughs> so that, I got to find you on Instagram. I'm still, I'm really new to it. It's been like three months, but um, it's been taken off. What I find, and this is just like a social media side is I really stick to written content. So I think it stands out a bit because there's so much imagery and videos and, I, yep. and, and I'm not trying to be something I'm not. I'm a writer uh, and a coach and I, and I coach through words more than anything. So uh, it's been fun. Well, hey, listen, the Twitter style posts on Instagram do actually very, very well. So I'm recommending that you punch out a lot of those and I will. Yeah, you'll see. It. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> um, thank you for being on the show. This was excellent. Uh, appreciate it, Brad. I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do this in the future. For everybody, make sure you follow Brad, get the book, and we'll see you in the next episode of the Vigor Life podcast. Have a good one.